In the grand theater of international relations and public perception, a simple appearance can stir a tempest in a teapot. Enter stage right, Prince Harry and Meghan, the Sussexes, who have dared to step away from the conventional path of royal duty. Their latest act, an appearance at a film premiere in the heart of Jamaica. An event that, on the surface, might seem like a simple night out. But in the complex world of royal protocol and the Commonwealth's delicate dynamics, it's much more than meets the eye. This appearance, like every move they make, is watched, dissected and interpreted by critics and enthusiasts alike. It's a dance on the world stage, where each step, each gesture, has the potential to ignite a fiery discourse, to challenge the traditional expectations of royal conduct. And so, under the glittering lights of the red carpet, the Sussexes stepped into a melee of scrutiny and interpretation. As the Sussexes graced the red carpet, the world watched and the tapestry of reactions began to unravel. In the limelight, Prince Harry and Meghan's every move, every interaction, every sartorial choice was under the microscope. From the whisper of silk gowns to the clink of champagne glasses, every detail was scrutinized, analyzed and often sensationalized. Their demeanor, a blend of royal elegance and Hollywood charm, drew a myriad of responses. Some saw it as a breath of fresh air, a defiance of the stiff upper lip associated with royal protocol. Others saw it as a deviation, a contentious disregard for centuries-old traditions, and oh, the narratives that were woven. The media, always eager for a juicy tale, spun stories from the threads of the Sussexes' appearance. The color of Meghan's dress, the laughter shared between the couple, the glances exchanged. Each was a thread, each was a story. The public, too, contributed to this colorful tapestry of reactions. Social media platforms buzzed with opinions, interpretations and heated debates. Some hailed the Sussexes as pioneers, breaking away from the rigid boundaries of royalty. Others criticized them, accusing them of using their royal status to further personal agendas. Royal enthusiasts, those ardent followers of all things monarchy, were particularly vocal. Their reactions were as diverse as their numbers. Some lamented the perceived erosion of royal decorum, while others championed the Sussexes' pursuit of individuality and freedom. But amidst this whirlwind of reactions, a larger narrative began to emerge. The Sussexes, by choosing their path, were not just challenging royal norms, they were stirring the pot of international relations, shaking the foundations of public perception, and triggering a re-evaluation of what it means to be a royal in the 21st century. And thus, a simple film premiere became a stage for a fiery discourse on modern royalty and global affairs. Beneath the clamor and the claims, the broader picture of the evolving role of modern royalty and its intersection with global affairs comes into focus. Let's delve deeper into this intricate tapestry, where every thread tells a story of change. The Sussexes' appearance at the Jamaican film premiere, far from being a simple social engagement, becomes a mirror reflecting the changing dynamics of royal duties and global relations. Their every gesture, every sartorial choice, every interaction is scrutinized, analyzed, and woven into narratives that span the globe. But what does this scrutiny reveal? It reveals a royal couple who have dared to step away from the well-trodden path of traditional royal conduct. It reveals a couple who have chosen to exercise their individual agency, to forge their own narrative, independent of the expectations and restrictions traditionally associated with their royal status. Their actions challenge the age-old notions of duty and diplomacy, of what it means to be a royal in the 21st century. They question the boundaries, the roles, the conventions that have, until now, defined the royal institution. And in doing so, they invite us to reassess our own perceptions of royalty, of duty, and of the relationship between public figures and the public they serve. This is not just about a prince and a duchess stepping onto a red carpet in Jamaica. It's about stepping into a new era of royal conduct, one that embraces change, individuality, and a broader engagement with the world. It's about the inevitable intersection of royal duties with global affairs, the intertwining of public perception with international relations. It's about the evolving role of modern royalty in a world that is rapidly changing, a world that demands adaptability, authenticity, and a willingness to challenge the status quo. In the end, the Sussexes' appearance at the film premiere paints a vivid picture of the scrutiny and the sometimes bewildering interpretations that follow the footsteps of those who dare to tread a path less trodden by royal standards. Ever 
wondered why the Princess of Wales left the London clinic in such a hushed manner. It's a question that has the royal corridors buzzing with curiosity. In an age where every royal action is catalogued with meticulous detail, the princess's discreet departure seems somewhat out of character. It's a stark contrast to the king and queen's very public exit from the same establishment, a display that brought with it a flurry of camera flashes and eager journalists. Yet, the Prince and Princess of Wales chose a different path, a path of subtlety and quietude. The reason behind this choice is shrouded in mystery, a mystery that's as captivating as it is intriguing. As we delve into the heart of this tale, we'll examine the whispers, the speculations and the known facts. We'll explore the royal maneuvers and the enigma that surrounds them. As we delve deeper into this tale, the intrigue only thickens. Shrouded in the comforts of Adelaide Cottage, the princess is recovering. But what exactly happened? The royal corridors are whispering again, and this time the whispers revolve around the Princess of Wales. She is said to be recovering from what is rumored to be abdominal surgery. And yet despite the inquisitive nature of the public, the palace has maintained a respectful silence on the matter, adhering to the princess's wish for privacy in matters of health. It's an intriguing tale, isn't it? A tale of a princess known to millions yet choosing to maintain a veil of privacy around her personal affairs. A tale of a prince, ever the devoted husband, steadfastly by his wife's side, navigating the ordeal with dignity and discretion. Prince William's unwavering support for his wife during this time is commendable, to say the least. He has shown himself to be a pillar of strength, a beacon of support, embodying the very essence of what it means to be royal. His actions serve as a reminder that even in the face of adversity, the royals maintain a dignified front, upholding their duties and responsibilities with grace and poise. This tale of the princess's recovery is a testament to the resilience of the royal family, their ability to navigate through life's trials with grace and dignity. It reminds us that despite their public personas, they too have their private battles, their personal struggles. Dignity and discretion indeed are the hallmarks of royalty, while the princess recovers, the rest of the royal family is hardly idle. The king, though himself in a period of convalescence, remains dutifully engaged with the affairs of the state. His royal duties for the time being are confined to the examination of red boxes, the iconic dispatch boxes that carry the weight of the nation's matters, a symbol of the monarch's unwavering commitment to his people, even in times of personal challenge. In the meantime, the royal children, George, Charlotte and Louis experience a reunion that is surely steeped in quiet joy and relief. After a fortnight's separation, they reunite with their mother in the comforting ambience of Adelaide Cottage. Their world, momentarily disrupted, now regains its familiar rhythm as they return to the warmth of their mother's embrace. Let's not forget Prince William, the devoted husband and father, who has been a rock for his family throughout this ordeal. He navigates this testing time with the dignity and discretion that is the hallmark of his royal lineage, a testament to the resilience of the monarchy. In the midst of all the regal comings and goings, one can't help but be charmed. The royal family's life, a fascinating blend of mystery and the mundane, continues to captivate us. Their resilience, their commitment to duty, and their pursuit of privacy amidst intense public scrutiny. All these elements weave the captivating narrative of the British royal family. In the face of adversity, the royal family shows remarkable resilience. The tale of the princess's discreet departure from the London clinic and her subsequent recovery at Adelaide Cottage is a testament to this. Amidst whispers of abdominal surgery, the princess, like a true royal, has carried herself with grace and fortitude. Meanwhile, Prince William, the devoted husband, has been a rock by her side, demonstrating the dignified discretion that we've come to associate with the royal family. The king, though in his own period of convalescence, continues to dutifully attend to the affairs of the state, an embodiment of dedication to duty. And then, there are the royal children, George, Charlotte and Louis, their reunion with their mother, a poignant reminder of the familial bonds that anchor this illustrious family. The public's fascination with the royal family continues, entranced by their blend of mystery and mundane. A blend of mystery and mundane, that's the captivating life of the British royal family. Could it be that a royal reconciliation is on the horizon? 
As the royal whispers of Amity flutter once again through the palace, they bring with them a symphony of speculation and the scent of possible rapprochement. The winds of change, it seems, are rustling the leaves in the gardens of Kensington and Frogmore alike. The narrative now toys with the notion that Prince William, the future custodian of the crown, may be considering the mending of frayed bonds with his brother, Prince Harry. The greater good of the kingdom, after all, is a cause that transcends personal strife. In this intricate dance, the Duchess of Cambridge, a beacon of grace and poise, is rumored to be at the heart of this potential thawing of relations. An old friend whispers that health concerns have a way of casting long-standing feuds in a softer light. Could the Duchess's recent ailment serve as a catalyst for reconciliation? The whispers of reconciliation are rustling the leaves in the gardens of Kensington and Frogmore alike. It seems that health concerns have a way of casting long-standing feuds in a softer light. In the grand halls of royal life, whispers of the Duchess of Cambridge's health have begun to stir. The Duchess, an epitome of grace and poise, has always maintained her strength, yet recent rumors suggest that her health might be wavering. Some speculate that this unexpected turn could serve as a catalyst for reconciliation, an opportunity for the royal brothers to mend their frayed bonds. Delving into the past, we find a relationship of genuine affection and mutual support between Prince Harry and the Duchess. Their shared moments of laughter, their shared trials, their shared joys, all add a layer of depth to the unfolding narrative. In the face of adversity, will their past camaraderie rekindle a spark of unity? Health concerns may serve as a catalyst for reconciliation, casting long-standing feuds in a softer light. As the royal whispers flutter once again, we can't help but wonder if a symphony of reconciliation is on the horizon. King Charles, the monarch with a heart that yearns for familial harmony, would welcome such overtures with open arms. This king, ever conscious of his role as a figurehead of unity and peace, knows all too well the importance of family ties that bind. His wish? To see the royal family as a beacon of unity, a symbol of togetherness, in a world often torn apart by differences. In his quest for unity, King Charles has made moves that are as subtle as they are significant. Take, for instance, the inclusion of Sarah Ferguson in the Royal Christmas Ensemble. Once estranged, now welcomed back into the fold, this gesture speaks volumes of his desire for familial reconciliation. In the grand scheme of royal affairs, such gestures may seem small, but they are the gentle ripples that signal the possibility of a larger wave of change. His recent efforts hint at his desire for a family not divided but united, not in discord but in accord. Yet the path to reconciliation is strewn with the thorns of past grievances and the echoes of harsh words once spoken. What lies ahead is a journey that requires traversing the rugged terrain of past hurts and misunderstandings. The shadows of yesterday's quarrels still linger, casting a pall over the road to unity. Yet, amidst the brambles of discord, there is a beacon of hope. Prince William, known for his unwavering sense of duty to the crown and the realm, stands at the crossroads. Can his commitment to the greater good serve as the compass guiding him towards the path of reconciliation? This is not a journey devoid of challenges. It requires the courage to face the past, the wisdom to learn from it and the grace to move beyond it. The quest for unity is not a simple one. It demands a willingness to replace the echoes of harsh words with the harmony of understanding and the thorns of grievances with the blossoms of forgiveness. The question looms large, casting long shadows across the royal narrative. In this intricate tapestry of royal relations, every thread is interwoven with history, duty, and the unyielding gaze of the public eye. Each stitch tells a story, and every color and pattern carries the weight of tradition and expectation. Yet beneath this grand design lies a more complex pattern, woven not of silk and gold thread, but of human emotions, desires, and frailties. The dance of reconciliation is a delicate one, a subtle interplay of pride and humility, duty and personal desire. It's a dance that takes place not only in the grand halls of the palace, but also in the hearts of those who wear the crown and bear its weight. The public watches, ever hungry for a glimpse behind the veil, but the real drama unfolds in private, in whispers and glances, in the unspoken words that hang in the air. As the story unfolds, one can only hope that the chapters to come are written with the ink of understanding and the quill of compassion. What would the implications be if King Charles III's health issues were to impact the immediate future of the monarchy? 
This is the question that has been echoing through the corridors of Buckingham Palace and the minds of royal enthusiasts worldwide. The recent news of King Charles III undergoing a medical procedure for an enlarged prostate has thrust this question into the limelight. This is a condition not uncommon in men of the king's venerable age, but it does bring with it the need for a period of recuperation. As a result, the king is expected to be out of the public eye for approximately a month. This development has cast a somewhat somber shadow over Buckingham Palace, the very heart of the British monarchy. The mood within these historic walls has been described as subdued, perhaps even grim. This is a stark contrast to the usual hustle and bustle that accompanies the daily life of the monarchy. The health of the monarch is not just a personal matter, it is intricately entwined with the well-being of the monarchy itself and the nation it represents. The implications of King Charles III's health issues extend far beyond his personal sphere. They touch the immediate future of the monarchy and the trajectory it is set to follow. This situation presents the royal communications team with a delicate challenge. They find themselves walking a tightrope between the need for transparency and the desire to maintain a semblance of continuity and strength within the monarchy. The narrative being woven by the palace, of the king being raring to go post-recovery, is a testament to this balancing act. But as we all know, even a monarch is not immune to the passage of time and the fragility of human health. King Charles's age and the physical demands of his role bring to the forefront discussions about the pace and nature of royal duties. This is especially relevant in a monarchy that is continuously adapting to meet modern expectations. In the face of these health challenges, the monarchy finds itself in a delicate situation. As we patiently await the king's return to his royal duties, we are reminded of the complex tapestry of challenges and considerations that come with the crown. It is a delicate balance between public duty and personal well-being, a balance ever so crucial in the life of a modern monarch. How does the palace's handling of this situation reflect on their approach to communication regarding the health of the monarch? A valid question indeed. As we delve into the role of the royal communications team, it appears they are masterfully navigating a sea of delicacies. They are tasked with managing the news about King Charles III's health a job that requires a delicate balance of transparency and discretion. The team's strategy appears to be centered around maintaining a semblance of continuity and strength within the monarchy. This is not a situation they've been thrust into for the first time, but the circumstances and the personalities involved do add a unique twist. The narrative being crafted by the palace is one of optimism. They portray the king as raring to go post-recovery. This choice of words, this particular narrative, could be seen as an attempt to reassure the public and the institution itself. It's a classic case of managing perceptions while ensuring the truth doesn't get lost in the process. In essence, the Royal Communications team is playing a game of chess on a very public stage. Every move they make, every statement they release is scrutinized and dissected by royal enthusiasts and critics alike. Yet they seem to be taking it in stride demonstrating the adaptability and resilience that has allowed the monarchy to endure for centuries. They are walking a fine line, balancing transparency with the monarchy's image of strength. It's a delicate dance, one that requires finesse, tact, and an unerring commitment to the institution they represent. The Royal Communications team is walking a fine line, balancing transparency with the monarchy's image of strength. What could be the potential impact on the royal agenda and public engagements in the light of King Charles's recuperation? That's the question lingering in the air as the monarchy navigates through this health crisis. The immediate implications are clear. King Charles III's health concerns have inevitably led to a slowdown in his royal duties. The king's need for rest and recovery has caused a ripple effect across the royal family's schedule with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge reportedly taking a pause in their whirlwind of public engagements. But it's not just the King's health that's under the spotlight. With King Charles temporarily out of the public eye, the royal mantle falls to Queen Camilla. This unexpected moment in the limelight could offer Queen Camilla a unique opportunity to step up and shine, potentially redefining her role within the monarchy during this interlude. Yet, amidst all the adjustments and recalibrations, there's a broader conversation taking place. The incident has sparked discussions about the modern expectations from the monarchy. In an age where transparency and accessibility are increasingly valued, the traditional, almost superhuman demands of the royal role seem to be at odds with the reality of human fragility. 
The king's health situation is a stark reminder that the monarchy, like any other institution, has to adapt and evolve. The pace and nature of royal duties may need to be reconsidered to strike a balance between public duty and personal well-being. In conclusion, King Charles III's health situation has undoubtedly cast a spotlight on the delicate balance between public duty and personal well-being in the life of a modern monarch. The monarchy's navigation through this period of recuperation will undoubtedly influence the royal agenda and potentially shape the future of the institution itself. Have you ever wondered what happens when royalty meets reggae? Well, we recently had the intriguing spectacle of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, that's Prince Harry and Meghan Markle visiting Jamaica. And not just for a spot of sunbathing. They were there for the premiere of Bob Marley One Love. Now, the timing of their visit was, let's say, interesting. King Charles III and Princess Kate back home were dealing with some health concerns. Meanwhile, the Sussexes were soaking up the Jamaican sun and it seems stirring up a bit of controversy. The British media, with the Daily Mail in particular, didn't hold back on their criticism. They saw the timing as insensitive, especially given the couple's interactions with figures advocating for Jamaica's separation from the British monarchy. The Sussexes' visit to Jamaica has certainly stirred the pot, but why? Let's dive deeper. When the Duke and Duchess met Jamaican officials, the reception was anything but cold. Despite Jamaica's ongoing dialogue about separating from the British monarchy, officials like Prime Minister Holness and Minister Marlene Malahu Forte welcomed Harry and Meghan with open arms. What's behind this warmth? Well, some believe it's the Sussexes' global celebrity status. They're not just royals, they're international icons. Their appeal extends far beyond the traditional royal sphere, and Jamaica, like many other nations, recognizes this. But there's more to it. The Sussexes' independent course, especially their engagement with figures advocating for Jamaica's transition to a republic, hints at a subtle alignment with progressive political movements. This is a departure from the traditional neutrality of royal family members, and could be another reason for their warm reception. The Sussexes' interaction with Jamaican officials paints a complex picture, doesn't it? Their visit, reactions to it, and the dynamics at play all add to the evolving narrative of Harry and Meghan's unique position in the contemporary royal context. The British media's love-hate relationship with the Sussexes is no secret. It's a tale as old as time, a dance of intrigue and criticism. When Prince Harry and Meghan Markle embarked on their independent path, the press was quick to follow, their lenses and pens poised to capture every detail. The Sussexes' visit to Jamaica was no exception. The British media, notably the Daily Mail, expressed sharp criticism. The timing of the visit, amidst the health concerns of King Charles III and Princess Kate, was viewed as insensitive. Moreover, the Sussexes' interactions with figures advocating for Jamaica's separation from the British monarchy stirred the pot further. Yet this independent course taken by Harry and Meghan, meeting with Prime Minister Holness and Minister Marlene Malahu Forte, key players in Jamaica's push towards becoming a republic, fueled intrigue. It painted a picture of subtle alignment with progressive political movements, a stance that starkly contrasts with the traditional neutrality expected of royal family members. This oscillation between criticism and fascination, a dance of disdain and captivation, is characteristic of the Sussexes' relationship with the British media. Their actions, often challenging traditional royal protocols and expectations, continue to stir the proverbial pot, causing discomfort within certain sectors of the press. The Sussexes' relationship with the British media, it seems, is a tale of complexities and contradictions. It's a narrative that continues to evolve, reflective of the unique position Harry and Meghan occupy within the contemporary royal context. As the Sussexes step onto the international stage, the world watches with bated breath. In their new roles as independent figures, Meghan and Harry are carving out a unique niche, one that challenges traditional royal protocols and expectations. Their recent actions, including their engagement with key political figures advocating for Jamaica's republicanism, suggest a subtle alignment with progressive political movements. This is a stark departure from the traditional neutrality expected of royal family members, a bold move that's been met with both criticism and intrigue. The warm reception of the Sussexes in Jamaica, in spite of the country's stance on the monarchy, speaks volumes about their global appeal. They are not just members of the British royal family, but global celebrities, 
whose influence transcends the conventional boundaries of royal reach. Their attendance at the Bob Marley One Love premiere was more than a simple royal engagement, it was a statement, a declaration of their independence and their willingness to engage with issues and figures that are typically off-limits for royals. As Harry and Meghan continue to navigate their evolving roles, they're constantly rewriting the rules of what it means to be royal. Their actions and the reactions they elicit are reshaping perceptions of the monarchy, both at home and abroad. The Sussexes' visit to Jamaica adds yet another layer to their evolving narrative, a narrative rich with complexities and contradictions.